Matthew stands at the door Jin just recently slammed shut, looking down at the tie in his hand that he left for him. We are shown a conversation between the professor and Matthew. For him, talking to people is an extremely undesirable moment. But he informed his lecturer that he had finally found a model for the sculpture. If possible, he would avoid unnecessary communication. But for a variety of reasons, he finds it worthwhile to suffer a little, rather than get even more annoying problems on his head. Here his thoughts were interrupted by a classmate, with indignation that how much he studied at this university. He did not receive personal advice, and Matthew receives almost every day. He ran after him with importunate questions, to which, Matthew stopped abruptly and forced the guy to return to his back. And he started holocrying to him for some kind of part-time job and tried to offend, to which Matthew just turned around and left. No personal contacts, telephone conversations, or if they happened, then not at his request. It has always been closed, but Jin is not like that. When they are together, all attention is completely focused on him alone, so much so that he turns into a different person, doing things that are not at all characteristic of him. When he looked at his body, he saw his ideal. He touched himself thinking of him. He inhaled his scent from his tie and fantasized about Jane. At this time, Jin was already in the building he was told to come to, and he walked out of the office, thinking about the stupidity of the fact that on Friday evening, he was called to work. When the elevator doors opened, a crowd of people appeared in front of him, and judging by his reaction, these people were not his friends. They also greeted him in a not the best way. The guy in front of him was the manager of their rival's company. But as it turned out, the boss herself called them to this building, which surprised Jin very much. As it turns out, the man across from Jin was once his so-called family, but betrayed him. The man opposite continued to offend Jin with various caustic phrases. He said, what, cutting your back as a sign of loyalty is still useless? Tell me, she still doesn't fully trust you. As he left, he added the phrase that Jin should go to his boss, because they also like to retire together. At that very moment, his patience completely snapped. He hit the opponent with his head against the wall, and asked, why did you quiet down then? Come on, keep talking. We are shown the cafe where Matthew works. Both of Jin's guards went there to drink milkshakes. But when the hostess of the establishment sees their bruises on their faces, she immediately begins to process them and seal them with plasters. She asks where they get these terrible bruises, to which he receives the answer our boss said that we have been out of hand lately, so he gave us a scolding. She was horrified that a man like Jin could give such a scolding. But they explained that this is all because of their difficult work. Every day they sacrifice their lives. And if not for Jin, they would have nothing. They told how they built the whole business together with Jin. The Xinhai faction would not be as influential as it is now without them. They started in the construction business, engaged in clubs, shopping centers, a chain of hotels, and it was a listing of only legitimate businesses. They also had connections about which they could not spread. But once they started talking about their boss, they couldn't stop talking. They talked about how he fought alone with 380 people and because of that he became a legend because he won. Everyone respects him, and if he raises his hand against someone, then this will be considered something that needs to be accepted with respect. He's good at business, not to mention fighting, and he's handsome too. Yun Fat, one of Jin's guards, said that he found it very exciting to be beaten by Jin. It was difficult for the hostess to understand them. Even though they didn't know what they did wrong, they found it strange how the director took it out on them because he never yells at anyone because of simple calls somewhere. And then Matthew blushed. Memories came flooding back. But the guards decided to apologize for that incident at the art museum, because the people in front of them seemed good to them. They said to ask them questions that interest them, to which Matthew asked a question about Jin's scar on his back. The guards did not understand how he knew about the scar, because it is not so easy to see it, since it is hidden under the clothes. But what Matthew told them was that Jin had agreed to be his model. And the guards told him that when he first started working in this circle, he made one deal with enemy, for which his company lost confidence in him. And to show how loyal he is, he made the guard carve the name of the company on his back, in order to show that he can only belong to one company. And if he wants to go somewhere else, he will be considered a traitor everywhere, because he is loyal to only one company. But the guards warned him that for his life this would not be a joke acquaintance at all. He replied that if he was worried about such things, then he would not have contacted him from the very beginning. He asked the guards to fulfill one of his requests, to hand over the key to the workshop to Jin, and said that he would be waiting for him on Friday at the workshop. We are brought back to Jin pressing his opponent's head against the wall. He has blood on his hands. One of the guards wanted to intercede for his opponent, but Jin easily repulsed his hand. His opponent said that Jin would be sorry if his boss found out then. Before he could finish, Jin simply said that his boss was no longer functioning so he advised him to find some remedy. Entering the elevator, he went up to the right floor. Already going to the office, he was followed by the words of his opponent. 
not to say what was the best decision to lead to his provocation, but to stand calmly and listen to what the traitor was saying he could not. He entered the principal's office, and they started arguing and calling names. In the end, we just decided to get down to business. The manager told him that Chifo had rejected their money and refunded every penny. He admitted his guilt in being distracted and relaxed but decided to find out why this construction was so important to them. The manager explained to him that companies have been fighting for this land for many years. This war began even before Jin appeared in this business. There was talk that the land was going to be put up for auction, and their Palm Young opponents were aiming to bid. That's why she met with their director, because she got very angry when she heard about their intentions, but she calmed down when Jin beat him. The developer company will have an advantage in the auction, but they will do everything to win. Jin said that he would meet with Chifo and ensure that they received the construction. Jin was sitting in his car and did not understand what was happening to him because he had lost control. Suddenly, his torment was instilled by a knock on the window. The guard searched Chifo's apartment and found nothing but a phone on the table. It looked like it was left there on purpose. And Manager O was neither at home nor at work. It all looked like a carefully planned plan. Giving the phone to Jin, he said that he restored it. Opening the phone, he noticed that the call history was filled with the same number and he himself was classified. They wanted to understand who was behind this, because the leader O was not so big a fish as to pull it off himself. He called the number, which was classified, and the beeps went off. We are shown a man who plays golf, and he is interrupted by security. With the words President, you have an incoming call from this number. He slowly picked up the phone, and when asked about Chief O, he answered in a calm voice, How are you, Jin King Yu? We see Matthew in the cafe where he works. He stands behind the counter and misses Jin. It was Friday night and he was expecting Jin to come to his studio. He constantly checked his watch, and his manager noticed this. She was worried about him, and he said that he had a meeting with an important person. He was walking down the street to the workshop, and suddenly came across a sign for a toy store milking adults. He bought this for himself in order to practice, since he promised Jin to be better this time. He looked at how they did it on video, and tried to repeat it. Jin was at the club. He was trying to distract himself from the failure of the bribe and continued to talk to the president. He tried to find out if they had taken Chifo out from under his nose. The president did not want to answer him, because they also wanted to get the construction of the museum. He abruptly switched the subject to whether Jin was still on the pills. Jin replied sharply, but did not deny it. The president told him that if he wanted to, then let him come in. Jin hung up the phone and continued to drink. A security guard approached him and said that it would take longer to find Chifo because another company had intervened. And then, some guy sat down to him, with a proposal to relieve his stress with a pill. He promised that he would immediately feel a new charge of energy. And taking a pill, he threw it into a glass of alcohol, and drank. He approached Jin and kissed him, passing the liquid into his mouth. He promised him an unforgettable experience, but the problem was that Jin knew it all too well. The paralyzed mind justified his weak restraint. To die in agony from a terrible thirst, or to swallow salt water with greed and die in the same way, it doesn't matter, it's all the same the same result. He secluded himself with that guy from the bar, and quickly hammered into his body. But when the guy came to the climax, Jin was still only in the middle of the process, and continuing to do what gave him pleasure, he did not stop. Just thinking about Matthew helped him a little. He remembered the key the guard had given him. But when the guy under him could no longer stand it, he offered to kneel down. And he did everything professionally. But only Jin thought about the inexperienced Matthew and asked him to do everything inexperienced. Matthew sat in his studio and counted the minutes. He had been waiting for Jin since the evening, but he never showed up. He was used to waiting. As a child, when he got to the orphanage, he could not utter a word. And every day he sat and looked somewhere with an empty look. He sat with his rabbit, which he fashioned for his comfort. But that didn't help either. And so he just got used to it. But in Jin, he was willing to wait forever, if his wait pays off, and he can get a reward. Annoying thoughts began to torment him that suddenly Jin had not been given the key. Or V-Durk he mixed up the days of the week, because he was a busy man. Or suddenly the desire to be a model for Matthew immediately caused him rejection, and therefore he simply decided not to come. But he hoped that the reason was not in this, but simply in his employment. And sitting down on the stairs next to the entrance, he began to wait. But he did not have to wait long, because as soon as he closed his eyes, the door swung open, into which Jin entered with a quick step. Matthew tried to tell him that it was too late to work, but Jin just shut him up with a hot kiss against the wall and asked where is your bed.